Hello and welcome back to another episode of Critical Reactions with your host Brian. We're going to wrap up this week checking out some brand new music. The track in particular today is Sufjan Stevens' Shit Talk, which he released about two weeks ago and debuted on his album, Javelin, which came out earlier this month. Now, I was advised not to go into this without some context, and Stringhead did present some to me. It says that this is a very emotionally charged album. Sufjan dedicated the album to his late partner, who died while working on the album. This was also Sufjan's public coming out as Not Straight after years of fan speculation. The album reads as a breakup record, but it's clearly an album about grief. I feel this is one of those cases where the album is great on its own, but knowing the context adds even more. Mentions that this is also the penultimate track, not the closer of the album, but, it, but that it is the climax. And given that the final track is a cover, feels more like a coda than the actual finale of the album. So, let's dive into this. Sufjan Stevens' Shit Talk. And see what he's bringing to the table today. It's very sparkly, very glittery. Twinkling, that's the sound I want. No more fighting, no more talking shit. Do yeah, so we have a nice five right here. Groupings of three and two alternating. One, two, three, one, two, one, two, three, one, two. Very calming. expansion of that final line into this chorus, presumably. big bass drum in the back keeping everything rooted it all feel like it it wants to just lift just ignore gravity and the bass drum is like it's what keeps it held down It's melancholic though, I wouldn't say that it's predominantly bright or happy. Oh 
fight at all No, I don't wanna fight at all No, I don't wanna fight at all No, I don't wanna fight at all It's specific moments in the track that I think carry the the melancholy.
I had a plan for where I wanted to take this analysis section, at least where to kick it off, and a couple of main points I wanted to touch on. And I still want to touch on those main points, but my entire introduction here is completely blown up. Uh, the final minute there had me reevaluating some stuff. And I didn't have quite enough time to process it yet. Um, I think I'm just going to start with the way I wanted to. And we'll see where my mind goes from there. I originally wanted to start this section off calling out the repetition. Um, it is a lengthy song that doesn't always feel like it's utilizing its time properly. And that's a strange way to think about it. What is the proper usage of time? Even outside of music, I don't think there's a right way for someone to utilize their time. But there's, I guess a better way to say it is I felt there were a lot of sections in here that could have been cut out without affecting the understood experience of the track. And to this moment right now, I still, I still feel that. There's some moments in here that I feel overstay their welcome a little bit without adding much due to the length and repetition. But for the most part, I think it was all necessary for Sufjan's intentions. Regardless, I don't think that that is a fruitful branch to explore. Particularly because regardless of how I felt the repetition was used or overused, it doesn't change what the song did and is. And so I want to move to the first topic that I feel is important, timbre. Something that he does very well here is choose the right instruments and the right voicings for each line. It's a, it's a skill set that I don't think really gets taught. You have to intuit it. And I think it usually is brought about from the other side of the table, um, especially when we look at songwriters and singers and multi-instrumentalists like this, where they sort of make all their own music and perform all their own music, uh, which sits in opposition to uh, mainstream pop and hip-hop and even some mainstream rock which has people who write the music for them um you know they're they're basically performers at that point but when you come at it from this direction you know the other way is is thinking i play guitar so i'm going to write music for the guitar i know what my voice is how could i utilize that if i really like aggressive mean crunchy guitar tones I need to write some music that pairs well with that sound. I should probably write some metal. But when you come at it from the other direction and you write music, and then you have to figure out what instrument's going to play it, especially when you come at it from a perspective like Sufjan's, where he doesn't ever limit his voicings, what instrument he uses. They're different from song to song, album to album. It's kind of, uh, it's that same element that uh, electronic artists sit within, where you have to make your own sounds. Um, and I'm sure they can come at it from both directions. I just, you know, was tweaking the, the uh, whatever it's called, the synth a little bit, and I came upon this cool thing, what can I do with it? Or I have this beat in my head, what kind of sound should do it? They can come at it from both ways. Uh, but I feel like for Sufjan, it's, it's the music first. 
And I get the notion that he gets these melodies in his head, these chord progressions, uh, the outline of a song. And from there, he has to decide what instruments are going to be part of it, what instruments are going to deliver that feeling and that vibe. And so, I haven't listened to a lot of his works. I think I'm at four songs now on my journey through his art. But what I've noticed is that every song seems particularly crafted timbre-wise to what he wants to get across, and this song is no different. There are instruments in here, even when it comes down to the acoustic guitar that appears in here. It's a very specific kind of acoustic guitar. It has specific strings. It probably has a specific body. It sounds like it is the instrument to play that line. I don't know if this is something he's developed over the years, the experience of choosing instruments for his art, or if it's just something he's innately good at. But there isn't a single instrument in here where I thought, yeah, that works. No, it's always, that was perfect. And it really comes down to, I think, him really understanding timbre coloring. What different instruments look like and feel like. And I don't know if he views them that way. I know that's a, a sort of synesthetic angle to take on it. Um, but you know, is this a round tone? Is this a harsh tone? Is it a bright tone? Is it a dark tone? Uh, is it narrow? Is it wide and full? He, if, even if he doesn't know he's doing this, he is analyzing the way instruments sound. And it, something that really stood out to me on this track, and while I was listening to it, I thought about some of the other stuff we've checked out from him, and just consistently, I'm, yeah, this dude never picks the wrong instrument for an idea. And what that means is that the end result, regardless of what the pitches are, regardless of what our intervals and chord progressions are, we already have the vibe of the emotion just by listening to the collection of uh, instruments utilized here, more or less. We can see the, well, I mean, in, in, visual, in a visual metaphor, just by listening to the instruments at play, we can get an, uh, a general image of what the song's going to be like, almost as if looking at a painter's palette. If they have predominantly warm and earthly colors, we have a pretty good idea of what the picture is going to end up looking like. If it's mostly cooler colors, we can have an idea of what the end result is going to be like. If it's bright and neon paints on the palette, that's sort of what's happening here. Even before the notes are played, just hearing the sound of these instruments, they perfectly match up with, I think, the sound that he wants to explore. And for this track in particular, we're looking at something bittersweet. There are more melancholic moments. Primarily, that sound we had at the end. We explored that for a couple of bars elsewhere in the track. It was something that we saw between groupings. Verse, chorus, and then this little melancholic thing. First chorus, and this little melancholic thing. And then the bridge, and then the melancholic thing extended out to our outro. You'll notice that the timbres utilized there are very round, warmer, and not necessarily timbre based, but looking at pitch, lower. There is something earthy and organic about those sounds that aren't present in the other parts of the track. To me, this is the human component of the song. 
Now that's not to say that the rest of the song is inorganic, that it's digital in any way and feels cold and static because of that, but these sounds in particular feel rooted. There is no absurdity or heightening, I think is a better word for it, that exists in them. They are unelevated, presented raw. We juxtapose that with the rest of the music in this track. It is glistening. It is shimmery. It's a lot of quick movement, bouncing around and panning. Basically, if I remember correctly, a hocket in our opening idea. Multiple instruments playing intermittently when heard together form a singular melody. I mentioned that a lot of the opening of this track felt like it was trying to float away. I still feel like that. It feels light. It feels unburdened. It feels dexterous and bouncy. And it's all done with these glistening, bright sounds. Not just the pitches themselves, which tend to be higher range as well, but the instruments he chose for them don't have a lot of weight to them. They are brighter, thinner sounds. They cut through the noise. And the melody that he writes for them is faster moving, higher notes, brighter, more enthusiastic chord progressions and intervals. It all fits together to showcase these two tonally separate ideas here. They don't ever play together. They always hear one and then the other. And there's a shift in instrumentation and composition between the two of them. The brighter part eventually gets embellished with a choir kids choir I think um, uh, maybe not I'm trying to think back on it, it was definitely a, a higher range choir though we're not looking at too many uh, bass vocalists in it it fit well with the rest of the instrumentation we had what I think is interesting though is all of this brightness is paired with well one the classical bass drum just a, a big old bass drum that you would stand on the side of and hit with a mallet by hand not like a, a smaller bass drum you'd use on a drum kit kind of makes me wonder about size I wonder how many inches would they measure it radius well, yeah, probably radius, right? Or, I don't know, radius or diameter for measuring drum head size. I wonder what the difference is between a, a kick drum on a drum set and, like, a, a traditional bass drum in an orchestra. Or, well, even the marching bands. The marching bands tend to have five, and they tend to be a bit on the smaller side. Because you got to carry them. Anyways, though. Again, off topic here, this massive bass drum, I feel, keeps everything rooted and chained down. It creates basically the only earthy, low tone and timbre. It is a very wide rumble rather than a narrow piercing sound. It, it keeps everything held down. It's like a voice of reason. Um, but yeah, we, we have that that kind of grounds everything but also his vocals they're very comfortable low volume airy and with a little bit of vocal fry in there Sufjan feels beaten down here throughout all of this you'll notice that the only time that the vocals escalate and reach peaks in volume or width or energy 
is with the choir. I don't think Sufjan, I could be misremembering this, but I don't think Sufjan had a line where he delivered it with impact and power. It was all in that low energy form. And I remember the context on this is that it reads like a breakup album, but is actually about grief. And whether it is a breakup or dealing with loss of a larger kind, I think both styles of both ways you can read this track are are matched by the vocal delivery. It feels like someone who is just kind of done. They don't have the energy to push forward in the way that maybe they want to or that people say they should. And the energy around them is positive and bright and celebratory and they aren't. And those little, the little peering into the crack and hearing that melancholic side feels more appropriate to how they're responding to the situation than the music that is around them when they sing. I don't know how that plays into any larger ideas. The only line in the lyrics I picked up because it was said so many times was, I will always love you. And given that this is a song about grief and or breaking up with someone, there's going to be a bittersweetness to that. And I think it's represented in the duality of the music. But I find it really interesting that the human connection here, listening to the voice, and possibly when we get into it, the words they deliver, what is most clearly understandable to us, to most of us, uh, is possibly completely just destroyed, low energy, no movement. Before we hit the lyrics, there is one thing I need to touch on real quick. The time signature. This is a 4-4 four, four track. Sorry. This is a track that uses 4-bar phrases. Those bars, though, are in 5-4. Now, there's two ways to view 5-4. I think it's an interesting time signature because it sits between... Ish. Well, let's put it this way. Four beat bars and five beat bars. Okay, we're going to ignore the other number, right? The bottom number. We're just going to look at the top, which tells us how many beats are in a bar. Five sits between two typically used even ones, which is four and six. Or three, sometimes. 6, 8, and 3, 4 are very closely related, but we're going to stick with the 6 in order for this analogy to work. So we have 4 and 6, which are very common in Western music, and then 5. It sits in the middle. It could be felt as 1 less than 6, where we're missing a beat, or it could feel as 1 more than 4, where we've added a beat. It really depends on how you go about phrasing the rhythms and melodies. This track in particular is crafted in groups of three and two, which makes it feel like we're going to do, we get our three and then we expect another three because as humans, we like patterns and we like recognizable patterns and we don't get the three. Instead, we get two, which is one less. So our phrase ends up being one, two, three, one, two, one, two, three, one, two, one, two, three, and we get this lurch at the end. It's very different from the inverse of this, which would be two, three, making us think that we're going to get a two beat idea or half of a four, and then getting something extra. One, two, one, two, three, one, two, one, two, three. You get that lurch at the end, like, oh, geez, we're still in this. You feel suspended. There's something extra here. The way we have it here, though, the grouping of three and then two feels like we've skipped a step. 
we're going down a stairs uh, a, a staircase and we put our foot down and there's nothing there you look down and well you've stepped two stairs down now where you thought there would be one isn't there in fact it's just a lot lower and so you stumble a little bit it is a representation of missing something is a representation of a lost beat I think it's really interesting to use it here for someone who's just experienced loss and to utilize it in this way another way to utilize five is to go across the beat Maybe you can do something like one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three, one, one, two, three. And so you have the double loss at the end, but at least you have a lot of threes in a row. And that would give you 10, which is two bars of five. You basically go across, across the bars uh, and your emphasis works on a two bar phrase. And you can keep bringing in more bars. You can go on a four bar phrase. That's 20 beats. Figure something out with that. You can even do it in groups of four. Five groupings of four there it's gonna feel like five bars of four four but at least it's symmetrical per bar there's a lot of ways to take five four and make it not feel as disjointed as it was in this track and he specifically leaned into that and presented it in a way that feels like we were always missing a beat that should have been there for a song about loss it feels immensely appropriate I think it's interesting too when you look at the way things are phrased here. The lines in the verses feel like they could be phrased in 4 4 without any issue. What tends to happen is that the third beat, whatever word is said there, is held out over the fourth as well. There is an extension of the syllable in order to cover the extra space that is more than the 4-4 four four would have brought. Lyrically, melodically, it doesn't feel like we're skipping. It feels like time is stretching. It is longer than we would expect as far as the lyrics are uh, observing it. But I think what's even more interesting is that on bar 3, it's mostly silence. There are give or take three lines per four bar phrase, per stanza, if you want to look at it that way. The third bar is silence. There is a moment to collect oneself and to think about what to say and how to feel, maybe even just a moment to feel for introspection. I like this way of divvying it up. There's something about putting that pause in every group of four that feels like dealing with an emotion. You get a couple of statements out and then you just you have to take a break. You just can't. And then you move on. And it works so well. Which actually, you know, I might be grasping at straws a little here, but even the idea of hanging on to a syllable from beat three to four and allowing it to exist longer to fill that space to make it feel like the bar is taking longer than it should while musically it feels like we're lurching forward and missing something, it could represent how long time feels like now. For anybody who has gone through a really difficult moment of grief whether it's because you know something about you was lost or maybe there was something traumatic that happened or maybe you did lose a friend or a family member or a lover time takes on a new meaning what feels what feels like hours is only minutes and so the stretching and squashing of time in general on multiple planes of the music feels very appropriate for a track about dealing with grief. The idea of things missing, of time not feeling right anymore. I'm going to take a second to hit the lyrics. We'll dig into 
what the song is about on those themes a bit deeper than we have already, and then we'll wrap this up. So there's really only two stanzas, give it, or two verses worth of lyrics here. Everything else is oohs and ahs and I will always love you and I don't want to fight at all, which is something that gets repeated a lot. There is a bridge, has one line, hold me closely, hold me tightly, lest I fall. But I feel like these are more of feelings, ideas given weight through repetition, more so than storytelling and explaining what all of this is about, which is predominantly told through our two verses. Our opening stanza, opening verse, puts the duality of the relationship into perspective. No more fighting, no more talking shit. Do as I say, not as I give up, not as I have failed to live. It seems that this relationship has been troubled. And we'll actually see this later on in the second verse when he says, Our romantic second chance is dead. So it's, uh, it had its lows. We'll put it that way. But he also says, I want you to be better than I was. Don't be like me where I gave up. Don't be like me where I failed to live. He says, in the future, there will be a terrible cost for all that we've left undone. Deliver me from everything I've put off and all that we've lost. I haven't taken every opportunity I've been given. And the future is going to be worse off for that. Don't, don't do what I did, right? We finish this off with, I think, a ridiculously important two lines. I will always love you, but I cannot live with you. I don't think I've heard any song cover this idea. There probably is some out there. There's probably poetry, too. It's not, it's not some unique concept that is brand new. The idea of... Well, actually... Colin Stetson. Not lyrically, of course, but musically. The love it took to leave you. Sort of that same idea. I care about you, I love you, I don't want anything bad to come to you, but our relationship does not work. It's an understanding that it isn't the person. You're not mad at them. They haven't ruined your life, they're not out to get you, they're not uh, full of jealousy, or uh, you know, they're not, they're not making you upset or being dishonest or anything like that. They're not a bad person, and you genuinely enjoy having them around you, you just can't live with them the way that a relationship is expected to. This is something I wish was more prominent in pop culture. The idea of recognizing it's not the other person's fault, the relationship didn't work. The two of you just don't work together. And the idea of, if possible, just reducing this relationship down to friendship again. It requires a lot of maturity, though, to not only see and recognize the situation for this, but to take the actions required next. I think it is more difficult to put the work into building and maintaining a friendship from this point than it is to just make a new friend.
but I think in some situations it's a worthy avenue to explore and it's just so common in culture at least in western culture to say nah I hated my ex I want nothing to do with them I hope they burn and go to hell and there's all this animosity towards the ex like even that phrase my ex has so much negative connotations to it if they were a good person they wouldn't be your ex would they And so these two lines just mean a lot to me. Even if they were the only two lines in the entire song, I think they would mean a lot to me. Just to have that stated in pop culture. I will always love you, but I can't live with you. We go to the next verse once again. No more fighting. Uh, it's... I think important to notice here before we get into the heavy repetition this is what is stated first of everything else that is going on this is what is most on their mind they can't deal with the with the emotional energy price of fighting all of the time and it leans into the way he delivers these. No more fighting. Airy, effortless, energyless. I'm done is what he's saying. And it's just so powerful. He says, I have nothing left to give, nothing but atrophy. Did I cross you? Did I fail to believe in positive thoughts? Our romantic second chance is dead. I buried it with the hatchet and put them at the foot of the bed. And I set all of it on fire. It's done. Everything about this relationship is not only in the past. I have forgotten about it. I have burned it. I buried it with the hatchet and burned it. And not too long after this, he says, hold me closely and tightly lest I fall. <sighs> I love the nuance of all of this. The whole concept of wanting this person and this relationship to be it loving them with everything you have and recognizing that it just doesn't work no matter how much love you have but even when you burn the entire relationship etch it from history you still can't get away from the feeling of safety you feel in their arms The entire rest of the song is, I don't want to fight. And it just feels like not knowing what to do next. It's over. But where do we go from here? I'll always love you, but I don't want to fight anymore. That is the only two lines stated in the final minute or so of the track prior to the outro. Those two conflicting thoughts, circling, intertwining, battling it out. And then the straight up melancholy, atmospheric, slow burn, exploration to wrap the song up it is heartbreaking those are my thoughts on Sufjan Stevens shit talk 
I still got to record one more today, and I think I'm going to have to take a break. I need I need a reset before I jump and see whatever Slift is doing. Let me know what you all thought of this. Did you enjoy it? Is there anything that stood out to you? What do you think of the analysis? What are your thoughts, opinions, and perspectives on this track? Above that, in the description box, you'll find a link to Linktree. Take you to this menu right here. You can find my music, ways to support the channel, a link to the Discord server, and so much more. Above that, if you could, like, subscribe, and ring the bell. I greatly appreciate all three of those. Until next time, remember to be critical, not cynical, of the music you listen to, and have a fantastic morning, afternoon, or evening, whenever you choose to watch my videos.